Um, dear friends and colleagues, thank you for joining uh, our today's webinar organized by Caucasus Edition, The War in Ukraine and its Impact on Conflicts in the South Caucasus. I am Sevil Husseinova and I am co-editor of the Caucasus Edition. We have already had a webinar uh, devoted to this topic, but from the other angle. It was more a kind of discussion of the editorial board and we were trying to reflect about the peace building in the South Caucasus in relations to the war in Ukraine. At the same time, um, the today's topic is a very multidimensional. Um, Russia in the South Caucasus is perceived as a potentially dangerous and hostile country, despite deep and mutually beneficial economic relations at least uh, in the case with Georgia and Azerbaijan, an open invasion of a former Soviet Republic cannot but arouse fears in the South Caucasus countries. In the early days of the war in, in Georgia, for instance, it was widely believed that the country would be the next vic victim of aggression. In Armenia, the discussion about the losing its independence. Finally, all three countries have received numerous immigrants from Russia. And this is not only a question of the impact on the economy, on people's everyday lives, but also of security. At the same time, there are some analytical voices saying that the more Russia goes to war in Ukraine, the more it's losing ground in the South Caucasus. All these questions and more will be discussed today and for this purpose, we invited experts from Baku, Yerevan, and Tbilisi. And please meet um, Ahmad Alili. Um, he is a director of the Caucasus Policy Analysis Center based in Baku. Uh, Georgi, uh, Georgi Kanashvili he is a senior project manager for EU for Dialogue at DAAD Georgia. And uh, my colleague, Azbet Kochikan. Uh, who is an associate professor at the American University of Armenia, um, and he will be moderating uh, our today's webinar. The format of our webinar remains as usual. We have one hour for our speakers and uh, 30 minutes for the questions and comments. We kindly ask our audience to use Q&A section for leaving their comments or questions. Um, the webinar is recorded and will be available later in YouTube. And uh, our webinar, as usual, is supported by EU. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, Asbit, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Savil. Um, hello, everyone. And um, as Savil mentioned, um, I will be moderating as well as I'm going to be participating. So uh, we didn't want to crowd the screen. Um, so I will be playing dual role in here. Uh, uh, and um, as um, the comprehensive, well, not as comprehensive, but as, as comprehensive as one can be as, as for an introduction, Seville did provide the background. So it's been 120 days uh, since the start of the war uh, on February 24th. Um, tens of thousands uh, have been killed. Um, the future is uncertain. The impact uh, on uh, so many issues, uh, political, economic, and social, uh, reverberating beyond the uh, beyond Ukraine and Russia, and um, we're trying to basically localize it. Look at the waves. Uh, how has have those waves of the war uh, have been viewed in the region in the South Caucasus? Uh, in order to do that, um, I will be basically, um, you know, raising some issues and we're going to col uh, collectively discuss that. So to start off, um, let's try to do some time traveling. And Ahmad, um, could you just give us an overview of how was the war perceived in Baku, in Azerbaijan, at the beginning of the war, uh, you know, the first week um, at a uh, population level, at a government level, what were the sort of like the gossip and expectations, let's call it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and for the question. So uh, I would say that the very first reaction was very similar to the Azerbaijan audience reaction during the events in Kazakhstan early January. We all forget about those events, but you know there was a, a high intensity development in Kazakhstan in the very first week of 2020 also, uh, also. So it was quite surprising that Azerbaijan audience, when uh, 
uh, the issues is about the Karabakh, Armenian, Azerbaijan relations, and the Russian place in these relations. Azerbaijan audience, they can show tolerance, but once it happens like that, it happened in Kazakhstan, I would say that Azerbaijan audience got much more uh, emotional and much more supportive of Kazakhstan and demonstrating anti-Russian sentiments. So for Azerbaijan audience, it was almost uh, you know uh, equal to the Russian presence in Karabakh because that's the that's the only way how uh, that's the the main filter that Azerbaijan audience uses when uh, it wants to generate certain reaction to the Russian uh, advancement around the globe. So that's why uh, when the thing happened in Ukraine, the same uh mentality the same filters they started uh let's say functioning and uh, i would say that if 20 and 30 percent of the population they wanted to support ukraine but most majority they took a strong pro-ukrainian position just because to show that they are anti-russian so that was the driving force and i would say that the very uh, second day of the war and you would see huge crowd gazer in front of the ukraine embassy in azerbaijan that also um, uh, was demonstration of the public sympathy toward the case and it was not just uh, uh just uh, you know uh let's say uh opposition parties it was general uh mood in the audience and the, the police you know, like the uh, police usually, uh, they are a bit restrictive, uh, but this time there was uh, no action taken against them. So they were allowed to hold this full scale, uh, like the protest movement uh, in support of the uh, Ukraine, in front of the Ukraine embassy. So I would say that this was the public perception uh, for Azerbaijan for a long time. It was uh, quite a success story that Azerbaijan had no foreign troops in it is soil. So once Russian uh, troops entered uh, Karabakh in November 2020, that was like the Azerbaijani audience felt that they lost something. So that's why after that, like the, let's say whatever happens around the world and the Russian troops uh, use force, uh, that immediately Azerbaijan audience takes a, I would say the pro-Ukrainian, um, uh, pro-Kazakh, uh, and they will basically supporting the one that is uh threatened by russian uh, forces so that's that was the that was the main driving force uh in 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 this case uh from the uh the government perspective as i mentioned like the uh, allowing that protest movement to be held in front of the ukraine embassy was a demonstration of the quite a big sympathy you mean and, supporting uh supporting demonstrators yes mm -hmm. yes and also uh i would say that um, Azerbaijani officials, they reacted uh, on the like the third day of the events, on the 27th of the, uh, uh, February, like the when uh, Deputy uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, it was like the 2 p.m. 2 a.m. actually, like the, he, there was a statement that we support the territorial integrity of Ukraine. So that was the very first sign. Then the next day, Hikmet Hachif made very similar movements. And then uh, recently, President Aliyev also, like in one of the international conferences he organized in Baku, he called the Ukrainians not to tolerate foreign troops in its store. So it always to fight against that. So mm -hmm. just, just shows that. But overall, I would say that Azerbaijan copied Russian position during the uh, Armenian Azerbaijan war in, in 2020. So Russia, uh, like the from a, well, whatever it did in terms of the military actions, from but as a from a diplomatic standpoint, Russia would say that he wants peace between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. So that same strategy was copied by Baku. It would say that like it would help Ukraine not to declare that and uh, Azerbaijan foreign policy, it's, it doesn't like like this PR elements in its foreign policy. So uh, it would help Ukraine, but not make a big uh, fuzz of that, make a real help, but then tell Russia that I want peace uh, between you and Ukraine. Let me know if how I can establish that. So that was the copy paste of that uh, mm -hmm. strategy. So I believe that, uh, yeah, this was the um, uh, overall picture of this. Any other questions like that, mm -hmm. let me know. Yeah. 
We'll come back to that. Yeah, it's quite interesting, right? I mean, whenever this conflict happens, especially the satellite countries of the former, so I mean, uh, the Russian satellite countries uh, or former Soviet republics, each uh, or or views it from the, its own perspective and plays on its own fiddle, uh, which is something that I want to uh, bring it to uh, Georgi uh, in terms of the same thing. It seems that in Georgia, there was the government was trying to walk a fine line as well uh, in terms of not imposing sanctions, but you know the uh, the popular sentiments were obvious, very, very much obvious. Uh, so what are your thoughts about it, uh, Georgi? Again, uh, going back uh, four months, uh, yeah, uh, about four months ago, um, uh, a snapshot. Thank you. First of all, thank you. It's my pleasure and honor to be with you uh, today. Uh, as for Georgia, and I was like, feel like thinking about the first feelings, even my own, let's say, personal, but that was then I was calibrating and like more or less that was like the, I would say the, for the whole Georgia society, I could say there was like this uh, shock for sure, the big shock, fear, uh, then anger and solidarity, I would say. <laughs> uh, uh, the first days, uh, uh, I'm not sure about like Azerbaijan and Ahmad did not mention this, but like, I think in Georgia, there was like the huge fear and the big question mark who is the next. Uh, and you remember that I think the second day, uh, president uh, of Ukraine was suggested even by uh, US uh, to evacuate and uh, they were so everybody was mistaken in a way the calculations regarding the you you remember the calculations from the military guys that they were counting just days uh, uh, and uh, like everybody was waiting that that could end uh, very shortly uh, soon uh, so of course here was that this big fear a big fear that like uh, Russians then will come to Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you take like very like, again, calculate that. And if you take the neighborhood, the most unprotected and most vulnerable country who is like where let's say Russian troops are here, very close where I'm sitting, it's like approximately 40 kilometers from Tbilisi. So that uh, fear was uh, quite legitimate. Uh, although as Ahmad said, here is not there is no necessity of any blessing for the mass protests from the government, let's say. And there was like a huge like rallies and gatherings uh, uh, traditionally in front of the parliament of Georgia in the main city. So here was like, let's say, I, obviously uh, Georgians have like quite close relations with Ukraine, Ukrainians as political also like let's say the like and this mixture and blendage is like was like translated even in a political participation of Georgians in Ukrainian politics like taking Saakashvili and other figures so I mean there was like really like this feeling that this war is our war on the like popular uh, 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 on the level of the public and that finally, during the course of the war, was, uh, let's say, translated into, uh, I would say, totally publicly driven movements. One was uh, the gathering of, of humanitarian aid for the uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure like when, but a like, couple of uh, weeks ago or months ago, there, somebody was doing the research and was like uh, calculating the this humanitarian aid Per, per person or per country and see and Georgia was the first country uh, in, in that ranking and uh, another like indicator of the support and like feelings was the uh, volunteers who came, went uh, to war on the Ukrainian side and there I don't want to be mistaken but I think that because I was uh, working on the article and still working on it of the it's a participation of the Caucasians in the war in Ukraine. And I, I, I think that like Georgians are the biggest foreign 
uh, group in Ukraine who is fighting on the Ukrainian side. Yeah, as for, uh, <laughs> and as Pat you mentioned also, as for the uh, government, that's that's different story. I would say that's, uh, again, I would, I think that that is also dictated by the fear, uh, uh, mainly. Uh, the Georgian government took a very, let's say, very conservative approach, let's say, mm -hmm. softly. <laughs> uh they um from the very uh, initial days of the war uh in parliament uh, opposition and the social pressure was quite big like to uh like sign any and uh, publish any resolution on the war of on ukraine yeah. and that was like well demonstration of the position of the uh, ruling party that finally we got like very strange resolution which is like strongly supporting the Ukrainian territorial uh, integrity condemning the aggression it sits but there is no word Russia if you read that you will think that that is like somewhere in planet there is the war somewhere very far and there is ukrainians and i don't know somebody invaded but we now nobody knows who invaded this <laughs> this country so a very ambivalent let's say resolution uh and uh, uh after that like well, these uh, discussions are uh, ongoing in georgia very harsh discussions i would say and uh between uh, uh let's say the uh, some or big part of the public between the opposition and the ruling uh, uh, ruling party, which is uh, very well, let's say, manipulating with this issue, saying that uh, uh, you want a war, we don't have to provoke, we are supporting Ukraine actually, but we are silent about that. Uh, and uh, it's like it's coinciding with the growing uh, internal problems in Georgia, right. I would say. Uh, and uh, at least for Georgia, I was uh, like, we have kind of, and me also, I have a, a little bit illusion that when there is this huge uh, external threat, that the political, let's say, elite is unifying uh, in the people. But that's not, not happening in Georgia. Mm -hmm. it's absolute polarization. Unfortunately, and one of, one of the main themes of the polarization is. Uh, uh, Ukraine and the Russia and uh, Georgia standing uh, regarding that war. And later, I think in our discussion, we will speak about the, um, like, let's say, uh, the results of it, because like today is very, like, it's yeah. coincided our discussion with this uh, candidate status yes. uh, for uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and not for Georgia. So mm -hmm. that had like, really the big political uh, consequences for Georgia, the Ukraine, and the uh, when we will Great. speak in the sector yeah. uh, later, we, I, I, I will return to that issue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was something I had taken note of uh, to include, but it's quite interesting to see how, in case of Georgia at least, uh, among the three countries, as far as I can tell, it was used, uh, the Ukraine war was politicized between opposition and government. Uh, because it's already polarized, right? The UNM and Georgia Dream have been on each other's throats for the last couple of, uh, well, for, for the good part of the last year or so, if not longer. And that also is one of the reasons why the candidacy was not uh, sort of some people argue that uh, didn't go through. But it's quite interesting that, you know, to look at the synthesis of these two in the case of Armenia, how it was perceived. I think, again, I don't speak on behalf of anyone except myself. Sometimes uh, even that is doubtful, but um, but it's it's quite interesting to see that the government um, of uh, with uh, with its limitations and dependence on on Russia, uh, especially after the war, uh, Russia being the guarantor uh, of the ethnic Armenians in Nagorno Karabakh, uh, they couldn't do much ab about it. And I'm not going to go into the details, but the you know, voting record uh, in international organizations is quite interesting to see how uh, how each country votes. But on a popular level, I think to a large extent, it also coincided with the demonstrations, anti-government demonstrations happening, although in that case, it was not as politicized as in the case of Georgia. But 
um, the pro-Russian sentiments are quite high uh, among the people. But that being said, there's also a huge apathy. I think a country that lost the war, uh, it is quite apathetic about anyone else's war. You know, when you just got out of, uh, I mean, you can have two reactions, either be more sympathetic and be more involved, but uh, that has not happened in the case of Armenia, uh, at least on a popular level. A uh, very, very few, a minute, like very uh, insignificant number of people demonstrated in front of the Russian embassy, uh, but that was of no consequence. Uh, unlike in Georgia, right, where the Ukrainian embassy and the Russian embassy, well, the former Russian embassy are across from each other. So, you know, people just uh, walking, crossing the street and, you know, pro-Ukraine, anti-Russia uh, demonstration, uh, demonstration and slogans. So um, I think to a large extent, the 2020 war itself uh, made the Armenian pop, uh, population population public quite uh, apathetic. Uh, the government uh, has been uh, not making any big issues. But I do want to mention one last thing before uh, we move on is that uh, it's interesting that in the case of Georgia and in the case of Azerbaijan, you know, the idea, the, the concept of uh, territorial integrity is, is very much entrenched right uh, in the foreign policy. Um, in the case of Armenia, that's there, but it's more, more about self-determination, although this Ukraine war doesn't have any component of self-determination. Um, but, um, uh, and uh, it is quite interesting to see the slogans or the statements coming out of government, both from Baku and Tbilisi, focus uh, on, on territorial integrity. Now, that being said, um, I want to go back. I want to see. Uh, I want to go back to Georgi, and then uh, Ahmed and, and I will, will will tackle with the issue of of Garapa. But uh, how would you assess Georgi the impact of the war on South Ossetia, uh, Abkhazia, uh, sort of status? What are the messages coming out of there? What are the perspectives coming out of there? Uh, and um, in general, Georgian-Russian relations within that context, just about four, four or five minutes max. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, it's also like very, in, like, uh, it was like, you know, uh, after, uh, let's say, this first shock, and uh, I would say this, uh, first feelings that like you know this especially first days of the war when you had the images from the battlefield with the uh, russian tanks everywhere like uh, destroyed uh, russian military's behavior let's say uh, quite obviously having uh, huge problems uh, and uh, ukrainians like uh, this feeling that Ukrainians are easily um, like winning, almost winning the war. And there was like this mass enthusiasm, not only in Georgia. I was observing again uh, some, not only uh, like Ukrainian, but uh, European, American um, experts who were uh, forecasting that uh, in a couple of uh, weeks, uh, uh, Russia will remain without the army and you know there was like these feelings if you if you recollect that I, I would say very like strange like forecast mm. uh, here uh, it has also some kind of influence uh, at least uh, and it demonstrated on social media and various experts were kind of writing or like some publicly influential people, let's say that, oh, now it's our time to solve the issue with mm -hmm. Abkhazia and South Ossetia, especially there were informations and like video reportages that Russians are leaving and taking their tanks and uh, military personnel from those both like territories. So uh, you mean but, militarily intervene, Georgi? I mean, to militarily yeah, solve. Yeah, yeah. there okay. was this sentiment in some segment of the Georgian population Mm -hmm. Like, I cannot say Georgian population, but that was demonstrated like right. through like experts uh, and uh, others. Uh, but mm -hmm. I was, as a whole, positively uh, surprised because uh, there was a quite uh, good uh, or quite strong, I would say, uh, peaceful backfire, peace backfire, mm -hmm. uh, because like there was like a, <laughs> it's <laughs> not. Uh, th those two words like peace and backfire, but it was like peace backfire or peace builders backfire. 
uh, there were uh, a lot of people uh, who were writing that uh, we the case of uh, Ukraine, whatever it ends, and if the Russia fails there, let's see, must not be uh, applicable for the Georgian uh, conflicts, mm -hmm. that we want like long-term solution and uh, to solve the issue in a peaceful consensus-based uh, way. Uh, happy, I, I'm happy also to register that uh, actually uh, not only Georgian public, but uh, as ruling party, also oppositional parties, um, where we, and many times was the same approach. Uh, there is kind of consensus for now, at least, that Georgian conflicts in Georgia, that Georgian conflicts have to be solved in a peaceful manner. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, I had the feeling and I had a lot of engagement because I can, uh, as you all guys, I can quite long period in, engaged in this Georgian Abkhaz, Georgian Ossetia and, and regional like meetings, conferences, peace building events, etc. And I would say that for the first uh, three weeks, four weeks or one month, uh, I I never uh, had so many engagement from Abkhazia and South Ossetia on a personal level. Quite many people uh, were writing, uh, are you planning something? Something like that. There were real fear that now the Georgians will try to uh, open this like second front and like try to, uh, that revanchism will uh, be the main, let's say, the motto here in Georgia, but that that's 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 not realized. Uh, as a, in a long term, I think that the uh, again, uh, let's see how this whole Ukrainian uh, and Russian uh, invasion in Ukraine like will end up. But it seems, and it's always already felt in both in Abkhazia and South Ossetia that there will be less money for them. Uh, and they will be under the same sanctions that are uh, in Russia. So that right. means a lot of problems. And uh, I feel the growing appetite from both, especially in Abkhazia, to have some kind of relations with Georgia. Mm. That I'm not saying that they are ready to, I don't know, return to Georgia. And that's not... We talks about the status, but there is feeling that something is changing and uh, better to talk with Belisi more and have more, let's say, flexible position on a number of issues right. than today. Mm. That's quite interesting, Georgi, the way you mention it. I mean, I think to a large extent, uh, what the public perceives and the, the gossip and so on. I mean, the basic analysis and uh, uh, not uh, simplified analysis is that it happened, Russia attacked uh, Ukraine, so it's going to attack us. And by the same token, you know, Abkhazia and South Ossetia would feel that, you know, okay, the Georgians are going to do the same. But obviously, um, you know, at times of conflict, it's quite impossible uh, unless there is a pre-agreed uh, uh, alignment or whatnot. I don't think there can be coordination like that because everyone one is holding their breath, not anymore probably, but the first two months to see uh, how it's going to end. And especially the dimension of the war, right? I think this is something we need to mention, bring it out there is that everyone, everyone, almost everyone thought, not almost, I think most people did so that this is going to end within a month. Uh, and uh, But when it started lingering on the whole dimension, not just the warfare, um, I'm assuming none of us are military experts here, but if we are, we, if any of you are, uh, you might want to contribute to that as well at some point. But um, but the political dimension, the political repercussion of elongated war or you know, extended war is also uh, uh, you know different than you know a very uh, fast, uh, super fast ending war. Um, so it's quite interesting to see that uh, in this case, Abkhazia, at least there are signals that we need to have more options and this might have precipitated uh, more a possibility of more dialogue. And I mentioned possibility, emphasize on it, than the possibility of war, which is more uh, dominant uh, among, the, uh, among the population. 
Um, and also, again, uh, it's very important to repeat uh, to re, uh, remind people and us that you know the internal dimensions. While the internal dimensions are there, this is all going to play out uh, one way or another by oppositions or by groups, uh, depending on uh, how uh, um, how the war would end. And um, I mean, this is something that I wanted to say a bit later, but it's quite important to keep in mind that those who advocate. Uh, or uh, are cheering for Russian defeat, uh, or um, and again at this point, victory and defeat are very relative and very ambiguous terms. Uh, I don't think there is an absolute defeat or an absolute victory for either side. Um, but um, a weakened Russia might be more dangerous uh, and a more uh, uh, more aggressive Russia, uh, especially when it comes to the former Soviet space. So uh, keep uh, keeping that in mind. I wanna move on now to the other conflict that um, in the region, um, the nagorno karabakh conflict, which actually has been in a process, right? It intensified in 2020. Uh, there have been talks, dimensions of Russia mediating, Turkey mediating, the European Union or the uh, Minsk group, OSC Minsk group mediating and so on. And, you know, back and forth the delimitation border and all of that seems to have been overshadowed uh, by the Ukraine war once the war started. So going back again, uh, a different dimension of the first question, Ahmad. Um, so how do you think, how, how does Baku see this war and its impact? Or how do you personally, you know, let's forget about the official line. Let's look at, uh, you know, how your analysis is about the impact of this war on the nagorno karabakh uh, situation. <laughs> let's call it, not conflict anymore, uh, from many perspectives, but. You're on mute. Okay. Yes, yes, sorry, mm -hmm. like that happens sometimes. Yeah, as uh, Georgi rightly mentioned, the very first thoughts right after this uh, uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine, uh, in Asia region, of course, was that, uh, is, it, is it our time? Let's, uh, like, can we use it, right? That was the very mm -hmm. first thoughts. And I believe that that issue was discussed in uh, social media and in many other places also. But the realization uh, came, I would say, shortly uh, to Baku uh, and others that, that whatever you want to get today from Russia, uh, you can get it tomorrow, uh, even in a, you know, like that it's going to be less costly if you wait a bit. So mm -hmm. if Russia comes like the, like loses some, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's of power, then it's going to be easy to get. So that's why like the, from a rational uh, standpoint, it was uh, clear that those sentiments that uh, uh, was, uh, that were there in the public opinion, they were, they did not uh, have any continuation in the following weeks. So that's why like even the, we considered the very first we considered with the explosion in the gas pipeline and then uh, from uh, as Azerbaijan side explained because of the uh, gentleman agreement there was that the gas pipeline in return of the two hates and we know the history the story behind those uh, the federal village and etc how Russian uh, uh, troops in Karabakh they uh, basically uh, like let's say they, they did not object when Azerbaijan troops moved uh, to those heads. So there was a, some kind of like the cooperation in this. And I would say that even in the December, uh, if uh, Russians, uh, Russian troops in Karabakh allowed uh, the French presidential candidate to come to mm -hmm. Karabakh, later they did not allow the MPs from Yerevan to go to, to Karabakh. So that's how changed uh, atmosphere changed. The other issue that I would say that that uh, was main, uh, uh, quite a main, uh, like the fact that it impacted the Baku's decision in this context was it his relations with the European Union. I would say that uh, the, the December meeting in Brussels and in the following months, it was like the Baku was highly interested in this uh, platform. Uh, so that's why any action that hurting this progress in this platform, that was not within the interest of Baku. So that's why uh, none of the, like the, let's say, uh, military actions were taken like that. Again, the, uh, as Georgi mentioned, like the very first week, the public sentiments, there was a, so many opinions that this is our time, let's use it. Huh? But then, so after some time, these issues, they like the, they started 
uh, let's say, appearing in the public opinion. And so that's why I would say that we have what we have. We have basically Russian troops uh, cooperating much more with the Azerbaijan troops in Karabakh than in uh, previous months. And Baku uh, willing to gain much more diplomatic gains in the European Union initiated platform. So that's why uh, there is uh, almost, uh, I would say that uh, the ceasefire or uh, let's say stab stable uh, stability was kept in the in, in the area. So mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Right, right. Uh, I mean, again, uh, it's more about uh, raising more discussion points and so on. Uh, you know, it's quite interesting that at some point the Speaker of the Ukrainian Parliament actually made a public statement. You know, saying this is the time for Baku yes. to open a, a, a another front. Uh, against the Russians and so on and so forth, which was actually perceived, uh, which fueled anti-Ukrainian sentiments in Armenia, uh, exactly. and pro or sometimes even justified some of the reactions that people were saying, say, see, I we told you so. But it's quite interesting, Ahmed, that uh, on February 22nd, there was a Russia and, uh, and Azerbaijan did sign an agreement, allied agreement mm -hmm. uh, on the day of the war. Uh, what's your take on that uh, briefly? Uh, okay, briefly, very briefly. Yeah, I saw that Phil posted that question, but I saw that we're going to answer that at the end of the webinar. Okay, um, two uh, statements, Shusha statement, uh, Moscow statement. Mm -hmm. If you compare them, you would see that both of the statements are weak enough to allow Azerbaijan leadership to uh, you know, make their own choices like they put in, in this vague environment. But Shusha document, it has, let's say, more concrete points, uh, more, let's say, substance to it mm -hmm. than comparing to the one uh, uh, in Moscow. But this is the uh, this is how Azerbaijan foreign policy works. Uh, I would say that uh, for the last two years, since the uh, uh, Karabakh War 2020, you can, like there were so many steps taken by Baku, which all considered as anti-Russian uh, by the Kremlin. So I believe that, and uh, at some point, like all of the, doing all of these uh, issues uh, of the taking like the uh, Baku, like the wanted to show Moscow that, uh, I'm taking your concerns into account also. So and that's how you, as Gorky mentioned, like again, like the question, like uh, who is the next? So that's how you avoid being the next one. So, uh, mm -hmm. so, but you can, you, you just, that's that's how it works. So, uh, but again, like the comparing to the Shusha declaration, you would see that there is uh, much more substance to the Shusha declaration than the Moscow one. Also, mm -hmm. if you analyze, Azerbaijan media in uh, in that time frame, you would see that uh, very little, almost none, media coverage of that statement signed in Moscow. Mm -hmm. Shusha declaration that was a kind of like the famous kid, like the, everyone want to talk about the Shusha declaration. But when it's about the Moscow, no one, like the even like the, let's say, I would say that um, official, official, no one wanted to talk about that. It, felt, it was like something like everybody wanted to forget about that. Huh? So that that well, was Well, it's the, the timing as well, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. uh, coincidences happen. You know, I, I believe coincidences happen. I just don't trust them. Exactly. Uh, so. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, but if you analyze the uh, Azerbaijan media, uh, media environment in that time, like mm. you pick the top five media outlets, uh, so social media, you would see that like the, the basically everybody wants to forget about that and the move to the other issues, uh, move to back to the Shusha declaration. Like for example, uh, a couple of days ago in Azerbaijan, in social media, and there was a celebration on the signing of the Shusha declaration one year ago. Mm. Uh, but still about the Moscow, nobody wants to talk about that. So that's right. the, that's right. like it. Yeah, um, uh, just a couple of quick, uh, well, from um, from Yerevan's perspective or from Yerevan, I mean, I mean the, the impact on uh, what is being seen here on the on the conflict itself, on the gorno karabakh conflict, one of the interesting things is that um, I think, uh, Ahmad, you mentioned it a bit, but, the, you know, just wait and see kind of a policy. Keep the status quo, don't stir things up and wait until, uh, you know, things change. And I think 
I mean, from my perspective, um, coming from outside of the region, even though I live in the region, but I find it quite interesting to see um, this whole me the, the mentality, uh, you know, quite widespread. It's beyond culture, beyond nationality. It's like let's keep things as they are, and we'll figure out how things, well, what will happen. Which you know, sometimes inaction, or more often than not, inaction can end up uh, uh, creating, uh, you know, not the desired outcome. Um, but um, from uh, from this perspective, with the when when the war happened, uh, and uh, Georgi, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in Garapa there was a lot of discussion that uh, you know, our, our, you know, Garapa might be annexed by Russia, which also the same thing about South Ossetia specifically, not Abkhazia though. There were some rumors about it, right? Uh, but then eventually, uh, even that was uh, uh, rejected or, or shelled uh, by South Ossetians uh, officials, let's pull, pull it authorities. So um, from, the, from Yerevan's perspective, uh, as I said, uh, I think there are so many different aspects uh, that uh, they're also dependent on Russia uh, in, doing, in terms of these processes, both uh, Armenia-Azerbaijan negotiations, but also Armenia-Turkey negotiations. This is something that Armenia has that uh, Azerbaijan and, Tur uh, and Georgia do not have, another dimension uh, of normalizing relations with their neighbor. Um, and uh, whether uh, one uh, admits it or not, that has an impact on uh, Armenian-Azerbaijan uh, relations. So um, there has been quite um, a sort of silence, uh, sort of uh, uh, an apathy, maybe even uh, from a public uh, level to government level about these processes, or as we don't know, uh, you know, diplomacy is like an iceberg, right? You only see a small fraction of it above the sea, above the water. Uh, what's happening behind closed doors is impossible to understand maybe this has given an impetus uh, to uh, to the negotiations uh, to solve the problem uh, to solve uh, come up with solutions uh, sooner rather than later um, and um, in within uh, within that context I think uh, the mood if you want to call it uh, in this part uh, of the Caucasus uh, in Armenia to some extent in nagorno karabakh or Armenians in nagorno karabakh is that um, uh, we are going to wait, Russia is going to win. Uh, and if that happens, then they will be able to impose better terms uh, on our behalf. Of course, without realizing that, you know, Russia doesn't impose any beneficial, uh, uh, you know, uh, beneficial uh, ideas or concepts on anyone's behalf except its own. Uh, so this is one of the key uh, elements, I think, in the case of Armenia uh, and the impact on Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, and one thing before moving on, uh, also, I'm trying to introduce, inject some of the questions related to the uh, to the uh, to the topics we covered, so that uh, you know they won't become irrelevant and it's fresh in in our mind. Uh, Georgi, you mentioned that there have been some sentiments in uh, Abkhazia about uh, you know, opening talks or uh, extending or you know, reaching out to uh, to Georgia. Has this been reciprocated? Uh, you think, or what is the general mood in Georgia about that? Or um, specifically? Yep. Uh, I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is the, let's say, readiness uh, for dialogue. Mm -hmm. But what kind of dialogue? There is always like that, that on whose terms? Like right. dialogue with Abkhaz and C. Uh, and there is a, 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 at this point, again, everything depends how the events will unfold in Ukraine. But I still think that this government and is very conservative in many things. They are better not doing something than doing something risky. Okay, so it goes uh, back to what we were talking about. Let's wait and see. <laughs> so exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. they, they they like uh, especially after the first term, they rarely touch any of directions. Like in let, I, now, I'm not speaking about uh, conflicts. They are not engaging in risky business, and I think that if something won't be one hundred percent sure they won't really engage in any serious like uh, talks regarding mm -hmm. Abkhazia and South Ossetia. If they feel that the, there is 
moment and we'll have some kind of the green light from Russian side that guys we are not we won't be uh, somehow annoyed if you engage Abkhaz and Ossetians to have right. some talks then they will step in otherwise they think that why we have to bother ourselves it's very risky in direction mm. you never know Abkhaz and Ossetians often like say something publicly then step back when it comes to the real let's say negotiation so better to wait uh, and why why we have to why we have to like uh, if we will enter in this uh, waters and nothing will uh, come out positive for georgia then we will be like really attacked from opposition from everybody we never know what's the russians reaction so i think mm -hmm. that they they are at least for now and that's their identity let's say they, that is one of their political identity not to be proactive mm -hmm. okay. if, especially if, if yeah. there is not obvious gains in that that actions of course of course i mean it's always about immediate gains right that's one of the other things in terms of uh, diplomacy or in any kind of a negotiation one has to think long term but obviously uh, most people are impatient uh, and uh, they want to have what is the immediate gain out of this uh, what can we get out of this um, now, um, Ahmed, uh, coming uh, back to the issue, um, again, not so much as perceptions, but let's say a synthesis of what is being discussed uh, or outlook-wise, right? What is the outlook uh, now uh, from Baku in terms of, um, I don't want to give scenarios. I don't think that would be realistic. I mean, I doubt that anyone, uh, you know, most people, again, right before February 22nd, they had, you know, no one was saying, oh, it's not going to, Russia is not going to attack Russia, but they did. Uh, but Russia did attack. Uh, so let's not, without going into speculation, let's, what are the discussions about the future prospects from an Azerbaijan perspective? How is Azerbaijan seeing this uh, in terms of uh, regional security uh, structure changing, its diplomatic activities changing, its relations with other uh, countries. Let's uh, leave the economic component uh, a bit aside now. Uh, we're going to talk about the economic uh, separately. But from that perspective, from the regional security, diplomacy, and foreign policy, uh, what are the dimensions uh, from Baku? Well, uh, Azerbaijan is the only country sharing land borders with Russia and Iran. And both are on the US and European sanctions. So, being the only country between these uh, two gigantic neighbors, like, the, and then you have China who wants to, uh, like, the, the transport corridor passing over Azerbaijan to be more active and replace Russia. And so, then you have to Russia and Iran who are under sanctions and uh, forced the United States, the West. So probably they want more uh, cooperation and that there is a little country in between them. So I believe that, uh, that there is a quite a big appetite like that just ignore that um, um, and that it make a direct connection uh, between the countries. And then uh, of course, like the, when you become the alternative to the routes passing from China to Europe, uh, from the Central Asia to Europe and the world market in terms of the energy, Turkmenistan gas, et cetera, et cetera. So that increases your uh, security costs enormously, significantly. Like, the, like you know, if, even before, like before you could afford like the uh, transporting certain amount of the gas, uh, but now you are directly alternative to Russia and Iran. So how you are going to be able to continue your uh, like the activity and the, it's uh, like the uh, it's all happening when uh, quite many delegations from the European Union are visiting Azerbaijan asking for more gas for more natural gas and then you it all happens uh, uh, is happening when there is uh, like the quite many high ranking contacts between Washington and Baku so it's clear that the security costs of Azerbaijan increase drastically. And if there is no security guarantee to a survey and that if there is a real security guarantees, like I would say that uh, almost equal to the one that is given to uh, Ukraine right now by the right. most of the Europe. So um, Azerbaijan, I don't think that it will be able to um, 
mid, uh, you know, it can continue like that it is, uh, um, you know, becoming a main transport hub, avoiding Russia and Iran. So that's why I believe that it's uh, now up to the European Union and the United States, like that what kind of role that you want to uh, Azerbaijan to play in this context. Huh? So ignoring that, saying that, well, economic benefits, like, and by the way, it brings a lot of economic benefits to Azerbaijan. So like, yeah, I'm jumping to the other question, but they are interrelated. So uh, like the, it means that Chinese cargo, it's mainly going to pass through Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan gas going to pass through Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan gas is needed in Europe. So it, from the economic perspective, like the point of view, uh, there is uh, enormous opportunities, but from hard security, uh, perspective it's disastrous station for Azerbaijan I would mm -hmm. say so that's why uh, I would say that we are we uh, don't know all the elements of the negotiations taking place between Washington and Baku right now and I would not be surprised if the security issues are discussed in this uh, in this context so if even Washington and Brussels says that uh, uh, like Turkey can do a good job in this regard so I believe that it leaves um, like the, this uh, sanctions, military technology sanctions, bans toward Turkey, that the and that this uh, the relations between Greece and Turkey, uh, the uh, like the, this issues that between the Finland and Sweden, it all uh, it also requires a certain kind of commitment to these issues. Huh? So just to make sure, so uh, the security cost uh, it, it 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 it's huge. It's a significant issue. And we all realize that. And uh, I would say that in uh, uh, most of the, uh, like the most of the time when you read that US president's uh, letters to Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijan president, you would see that Azerbaijan expected to play a Transcaspian, you know, like the, the, the role in the, this region as a, a connector. connector. Uh, yes. And I would see that yesterday President Ali was in Uzbekistan. You would see how he was greeted there. So like, the, you know, Azerbaijan songs everywhere. Uh, the president of Uzbekistan following him everywhere. So it's like, it's, it shows that in the Central Asia, there is a great interest toward these issues also. And Azerbaijan um, start playing uh it is let's say it's a role in this regard but the security issues i believe that uh, azerbaijan would not do anything like that without clear security guarantees uh but we don't know we are not aware of that right. so situation is changing and fast and that today uh, right now when we are um, talking to you uh azerbaijan president's official website it just posted photos how we met with uh, uh sergey lavrov so I believe that in this context, the quite interesting developments are taking place. And I believe that uh, but in, in Baku, if you listen to the people in Baku, you would see that uh, there, are, there is a certain proudness that this balanced foreign policy worked very well uh, so far. So, and Azerbaijan wants to continue that. So mm -hmm. now the question is how you're going to balance all of these issues. Uh, and frankly speaking, I would wait a bit and then answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, I mean, this is quite interesting, uh, as you put it, uh, in terms of the, the impact and whatnot. And of course, uh, one dimension that we shouldn't forget is the European involvement uh, and or lack of in this context, you know, while Europe or, or the West's uh, not just the West, the West are dealing with Russia in, on Ukraine, to what extent the region is being neglected or is being overshadowed by the war and not enough interest. Um, just one interesting comment, and uh, this is a discussion that uh, came in a discussion that came up last week uh, um, in a workshop in Europe uh, about this, you know, uh, this exact uh, question about Azerbaijan's neutrality or balanced foreign policy. And one of the attendees actually asked, you know, would Azerbaijan be able or afford to have a balanced foreign policy if it didn't have oil? Uh, you know, it's about the know-how as well and the guarantees as well uh, uh, and the resources that you have. Um, Georgi, what about you? What what are your uh, what's your read about the future prospects? You know, uh, and especially again, you know, European uh, EU uh, candidate membership uh, candidacy is, was a big big issue. There was a huge rally uh, right before they announced that Ukraine and Moldova got the uh, membership uh, status or, or, or the, the candidacy status. Georgia didn't. Um, 
to, again, can you just weave all of these together uh, in terms of outlook? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, like it's really like, uh, I would say here in Georgia, we're a little bit like trying to understand what 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 is our government doing, mm. uh, what they are trying to achieve, um, uh, in what way, like how they managed uh, in uh, the situation of such a like unbalanced, let's say, regional and even world like the this conflict which is like real, real nearby and uh, our government really managed to uh, to turn even the very close friends into not enemies but like those who distanced from georgia and at least from georgian government because like they were for those months i constantly uh, fighting uh, with uh, the MPs of uh, like Parliament, European Parliament, with certain like uh, representatives of the government, uh, mainly with Europeans. Uh, internally, they also like very often, uh, like while having this like polarization and conflict with the uh, opposition, uh, and uh, they uh, put in the prison one of the uh, uh, TV station boss. Uh, and, you know, they, they are doing everything uh, like uh, opposite uh, than anybody is awaiting from them. Mm -hmm. I don't understand and many don't understand what they are trying to achieve with this. Um, we Here is the feeling of growing isolation. Uh, and uh, the moving uh, in, let's say, gray zone. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, let's see, it's not clear. A, a lot of like depends on internal dynamics here in Georgia. Uh, and also like, again, the, the uh, situation uh, around uh, Ukraine, uh, it is clear on the let's say regional level, it is obviously clear that Georgian, Georgia is very much interesting in peace in the region and right. peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan around the issues related to Karabakh. Uh, because another war, like nobody knows like how that could end up. Uh, and uh, in that, like Georgia's shuttle diplomacy and the prime minister was uh, involved in that is was like uh, quite uh, like well received i think in uh, yerevan and baku and in tbilisi also and in neighborhood and i think that we will continue thinking in that direction and supporting as much as possible also of course there is the trend every many are speaking about that but uh, especially now with the ukraine i think it is time for this this little regional alliances are also growing because this this axis of uh, baku Tbilisi, ankara uh, is uh, one could be one of the reliable let's say the uh, direction for the georgian security also because it's not uh, often clear like who can guarantee our security and uh, of course for uh, uh, the Everything what uh, Ahmad was telling about the gas, oil, uh, uh, other like uh, positioning of the Azerbaijan, of the uh, connecting uh, country between the Caspian and uh, uh, yes. Central Asia, and, uh, it, it, it partially fails if Georgia is under attack. Mm -hmm. And if uh, Armenian Azerbaijani relations are not fixed very soon. And mm -hmm. I don't see that like Baku and Yerevan and Ankara will repair those relations which were spoiled like 30 years before uh, so much and they this this will have such a pace that they will reach such a let's say um, mutual understanding and uh, trust that uh, uh, in case of Georgia's uh, uh, 
like uh, fragile security or occupation, I, I don't know any type of okay. conflict that that could work. So I think for, for Baku and for Ankara also, Georgia's security is uh, uh, very important. As for Georgia, the, uh, is very important the security of Baku and of course of the, uh, Turkey. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's let's see how. And there was the question about, or I, I saw that like it's not still not clear, and if that Georgia can automatically became the part of the yeah. or to get the status if we uh, get your act to, together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, mostly but, the political parties, right? Uh, I mean, it yeah, has become a joke in many ways. This this uh, situation regarding the. Ukraine and Moldova, and uh, actually that trio was initiated by Georgian side, like a year mm. and some ago, and like this uh, jumping out, or I don't know, uh, uh, from this trio uh, is psychologically not very pleasant for many in Georgia. Mm. So no, it's, uh, yeah. many question marks, more, more, mm -hmm. uh, more. Uh, no, of uh, course, but, of course. Yeah. But that's and the job, the right? To raise the right questions, to look at for the answers. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, still, uh, with uh, there is one uh, tendency also felt from after Karabakh, but still uh, with uh, now with Ukraine crisis and the role of the Turkey, that uh, well, like whatever the results in Ukraine, like Turkey's role in the region obviously is growing. Mm -hmm. And we are also have to think how to accommodate uh, to that uh, situation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite okay. interesting that we all, uh, including myself, fall sometimes in the trap of thinking binary, either or, uh, either Russia or West or Russia, Turkey. But more often than not, especially in the last couple of years, uh, five, six years, we've been seeing more and more rapprochement between Ankara and Moscow. Uh, and you know, Ankara is not necessarily going to be an alternative for uh, for Moscow uh, from that perspective. I mean, this is a discussion for uh, for uh, another topic, for another a theme. It's another thematic topic. Uh, but um, you're absolutely right in terms of thinking uh, that Turkey Turkey is uh, going to be, or as officially it is now, Turkey is. Uh, they just changed their name officially, rebranding. Uh, is uh, is a major player, but to what extent it is a balancer uh, with Moscow uh, and to what extent uh, Moscow and Ankara can work together. But I mean, most of these echo in Armenia as well in terms of the apprehension. You know, there is always a, uh, an apprehension uh, as to what's, uh, what is the big country, what are the big countries going to do? I think Lavrov's visit uh, to Baku uh, and Yerevan uh, recently, uh, to a large extent, it is an attempt to also, you know, either uh, comfort, but also reiterate uh, that, you know, regardless of what's going to happen, Russia, this is Russia's backyard, whether you like it or not. I'm, I think they've been communicating that clearly with Georgia in many, many ways and for many, many years. Um, and in this respect, I think Yerevan's priorities would be once um, the, the turmoil settles, I'm not saying the war ends, uh, is how to push forward uh, with, uh, um, um, with uh, sort of uh, normalizing relations with both Turkey and, but more importantly, with Azerbaijan. One of the things uh, we have to uh, also keep in mind is that uh, from an Armenian perspective, the guarantor of the ethnic Armenians in nagorno karabakh is Russia. And any attempt or any chance of Russian uh, peacemakers uh, uh, withdrawing from nagorno karabakh from the contact line and so on is uh, viewed as disastrous. So they want to have at least some kind of a stability. Uh, not that Russia is at any point willing to leave. Um, uh, I mean, once Russia establishes a foothold, it rarely, rarely leaves. And I think this is also a concern. Uh, in Azerbaijan as well, to have, as Ahmad mentioned as well at the beginning, that now there are Russian troops in on Azerbaijani soil. By the way, um, just in parentheses, if any you guys, if any, the audience has any questions, please type them now. I'm trying to incorporate them uh, thematically so that uh, we can move on to other issues. We have another 20 minutes or so. Uh, we have more. We can have more topics. But if you have any questions about whatever we discussed so far, uh, please incorporate that. 
um, uh, or, or ask those in the Q&A uh, uh, segment. Um, so um, Russian presence is very, very important. And I don't think uh, Russian uh, troops are going to be leaving uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh anytime soon. The question is, uh, would Armenia be able to um, develop some kind of a, I'm not even going to call it balanced, but less Russian-oriented policy, uh, especially with the sanctions? Uh, you know, there is always the issue of collateral damage, uh, collateral victim uh, in this case, although Armenia and Georgia specifically have not been put under sanctions, uh, but there is a lot of economic activity going on, uh, both from Georgia to Russia and vice versa, and Armenia, Russia, bilateral. Um, so it all depends on how things are going to develop. Um, and, um, you know, there are, one has to think about short-term versus long-term gains uh, and consequences, right? You can gain on the short-term um, for instance, in the case of Armenia, uh, you know, it might benefit from a short term uh, sanctions on Russia, but then the long term, it might not yield that benefits. So it's about having that flexibility. Uh, but I think uh, all, I mean, in the case of Georgia, as Georgi mentioned, it's, uh, you know, the internal uh, conflict, uh, the, the polarization, political polarization that makes it uh, impossible uh, for have, to have a coherent vision as to what needs to be done. In the case of Armenia, I think thinly spread too many issues to deal with, not so much as opposition, but also, you know, too many issues that, uh, you know, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Armenia, Turkey, you have to, you have to look at that. As Azerbaijan seems to fare well, uh, relatively speaking, uh, even though it is in between two countries that are sanctioned by the West. But you know that reminds me of a quote um, that there is a little difference between obstacle and opportunity. It's how you take advantage. It's how you can turn both to your advantage. Uh, I think it's Machiavelli who, who, who said this. So uh, one has to think that strategically, which again not only us as academics, but usually policymakers also specifically in Armenia, I can speak on that, uh, uh, you know, from what I observe, are dealing with binaries rather than looking at uh, obstacles as opportunities, as, as uh, things that you can uh, take advantage of. Um, and uh, one last thing, um, there was a question, Ahmed, about this segment. I want to talk a bit more, uh, tad about the economic impact. And obviously, while economy is not a panacea for every, every problem, uh, but um, uh, before going on there, um, do you think that the, the Russian presence uh, in Karapak uh, had any impact on uh, anti, uh, growing anti-Russian sentiments in Azerbaijan? Um, and overall, uh, you know, on if let's say, you know, if uh, anti-Russian sentiments were at some level uh, in Azerbaijan, has it increased or decreased since the war in Ukraine? <clears throat> well, yes, uh, I mentioned the very, uh, the very first question, like the, now Azerbaijan is the filter the events around the world based on that. Uh, the, the Kazakhstan events in January of 2022, Ukraine events, that all gets filtered uh, from that perspective from the Russian uh, presence in Karabakh. So that's one of the biggest issues affecting uh, Azerbaijan perception uh, about Russia. Mm -hmm. So, and I believe that it would be really, really unwise of Russia to ignore this factor. So, and I believe that, uh, like the, uh, the now, like the by controlling Karabakh, uh, Russia can lose the quite a big uh, sympathy in Azerbaijan and losing. And also, uh, during the war, like uh, I would say that there, there, there were five flags in the streets of the Baku. Mm. Uh, of course, it was Azerbaijan flag. The next flag was Turkish flag. Then it was Israeli, Pakistani, and, and Ukrainian Pakistan, flags. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So these five flags. So uh, like it was a quite a weird combination, I would say, from international, but. They, this is the what we had in the streets of the Baku during the uh, war uh, in, in, in Karabakh in 2020. So uh, this shows that, uh, like, you know, the Turkish component is gaining much bigger presence in Azerbaijan mindset, in Azerbaijan public opinion. So that uh, I would I believe that that pushes away the uh, sympathy toward other players. 
So if there was some sympathy toward uh, another player, well, I believe that with the, with the role of the Turkey, Israel, Pakistan, Ukraine in these issues, uh, it kind of replaces the uh, the ones that existed before. So that's why, yes, that definitely the war is affecting public sympathy in this uh, in this regard. And the social networks, if you analyze social networks in Azerbaijan, that clearly demonstrates that trend. So uh, yes, this is the case. Uh, what are the more uh, tangible impacts of uh, of the conflict? Um, uh, I, I will collect a couple of questions, but I'm going to more move on to the overall uh, impact. It has been the move, uh, the economic component, economic human component. Um, by some accounts, although there are non non official ones, and according to various international organizations, by um, beginning of June there were about 300,000 Russians living in Georgia and Armenia. No numbers in Azerbaijan, maybe Ahmed, you would be able to give us some uh, perspective, but it is quite possible. You know, Tbilisi, uh, when you walk around the streets in Tbilisi or, and or in Yerevan, you would see a lot of, or you would hear a lot of Russian, Russian speaking, uh, Russians, uh, I'm assuming, uh, and to a lesser extent, Ukrainians probably. And the logic is that not the Ukrainians uh, don't like to come to Georgia or Armenia, but it's easier for them to go to uh, Central European countries, like right, uh, uh, Poland, uh, Czech, Czechia, or uh, Romania, and so on. So, um, um, uh, Georgi, could you give a, or an overview about the, the sentiments and the impact um, on on this uh, on the presence of Russian um, uh, economically? I mean, I know, for instance, in the case of Armenia, real estate prices have gone up. Rental has gone up. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, you know um, uh, consumer goods have gone up. The prices of consumer goods have gone up, um, and uh, obviously, it's an opportunity for many people to make money. So, uh, what is the perspective in 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 Georgia about this? Even though there is a quite a high anti-Russian sentiment. <clears throat> That's uh, yeah, that was the huge discussion a couple of months ago here in Georgia regarding those people coming to Georgia, let's say. Uh, I was uh, looking like just uh, today, like just to have the exact figure and for March, April and May, uh, approximately 170,000 uh, uh, Russians uh, uh, get uh, to the Georgia. Uh, we, uh, but we don't have the uh, exact numbers how uh, many of them left the country. Right. But we have to suppose that significant number of them uh, are still uh, in Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, mainly in uh, Tbilisi, in Batumi, uh, and by the way, in Kutaisi. Uh, mm. Kutaisi is the third large uh, city in Georgia. And it's also easily explainable in a way that there is the airport. Mm. Uh, so that makes it like more more mobile, uh, the life of those people. That's are predominantly young people, predominantly with this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, engaged uh, in the works like IT and, you know, this new... Digital uh, nomads. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of like discussions in Georgia initially that why they they came to Georgia that we have to serve them now and uh, uh, if they were so oppositional why they did not like um, make their statements in Russia and why they are not there and some were mm -hmm. saying that actually they are not anti-Putinist and all that like. So there were a lot of like, okay. and of course, there were some kind of the discussions regarding that, oh, that could be the pretext for Russians to invade the Georgia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, we see the, the case of Ukraine and many other situations when Russia did not need too big pretexts or like to invade the country. So, uh, and plus, of course, there were also a lot of like discussions that, uh, uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, some, uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, there were also discussions that, uh, and, and uh, actually that was the case that uh, some Russians, uh, uh, again, they were the uh, 
huge discussions uh, that some Russians were refused to enter mm. Georgia. Uh, those like uh, who were, let's say, identified as the very, let's say, fierce oppositional uh, for, from, for example, the Dojd, you know, mm. this TV rain and see. Mm. But there also was a little bit arbitrary approach. Like some people were let in, some not. So there is not, because like some people from the TV rain came and they have some regional little, but like broadcasting from uh, from Georgia. So, you know, it's not often understanding why they are letting one uh, oppositional figures and while not uh, giving the possibility to, to enter others. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as for economical uh, uh, the absolutely the same uh, impact that aspect as what you said that means that growing like prices uh, for 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 like to hire the flat uh, and see and like some this like everyday complaints from georgian side that uh, georgians who were hiring the flats for for cheaper price now they have to pay mm -hmm. more see. And uh, uh, that's always like uh, there is also second situation that it's often not clear who they uh, those people are. They are, as you well mentioned, Russian speakers because we we had quite big influx of uh, Belarusians, mm -hmm. especially with these events in Belarus. And we have, if I'm not mistaken, something around thirty thousand uh, also coming from uh, Ukraine. So as a whole, it makes quite big population of the Russian speaker um, people in these uh, uh, mainly three cities. I would say mm -hmm. Tbilisi, Bakumi, and partially Kutaisi. Okay. Um, Ahmed, uh, I'm assuming, and again, from what I've heard, you didn't, you, you, you don't see that much of an influx of Russians or Russian speakers to Azerbaijan or to Baku. Uh, but the uh, economic component, uh, you started talking about that as well, gas and pipeline, that's something that is unique for Azerbaijan, although uh, Georgia by association, by uh, transition. Um, there are big prospects of Azerbaijan now to uh, increase its uh, oil export, oil and gas export to Europe. Uh, there have been a lot of talks already in Bulgaria, in Romania about importing that. So um, how is that viewed? Is that uh, in any way you think uh, antagonizes or angers Russia? Uh, uh, or, you know, again, is that something that's being viewed by Baku as a great opportunity uh, to diversify its exports or to increase its exports? Okay, a few words about the uh, uh, Russian speakers in Baku. Uh, I would say that yes, definitely in terms of the quantity, uh, the situation is completely different in Baku. Uh, like the very first week when Azerbaijan Airlines used to fly from Moscow to Baku, uh, yes, we would see some, uh, let's say, non-familiar faces in streets and uh, the Russian speech would be quite around. Uh, um, and uh, when you enter the market, small market, you would see quite many uh, blonde heads, but not anymore. Like I would say that, that like the second or third week when the Azerbaijan Airlines stopped applying, those, uh, uh, there was uh, like the, the city was back to the, uh, its normal conditions, but still the, you can sense that there are some numbers growing. And I would say that, uh, and Azerbaijan was quite a, like the, quite quick to cut the airline connection with the, the Russia. And I believe that there was a, this fear that at some point Russia might use Azerbaijan in Russia as a pressure tool against Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. uh, because from time to time, uh, that's what we see, all right? This, uh, you know, uh, the workers, seasonal workers, or the migrants sending back the Central Asia. So there was a, this expectation that due to Azerbaijan's position uh, on this issue, Russia might use it against Azerbaijan. So the country was kind of like preparing itself for the for the huge influx of the forced people from uh, from Russia. So that's why like it was a like the, the, the connections airplane connections they were right. uh, sharp. But 
uh, we have quite been anecdotal uh, evidences that um, uh, the duet of Baku being a quite a, let's say, living cost here being quite, quite high, people with, the, let's say, with the more financial stability, they prefer Baku. So that's why, yes, there are some in, let's say, in elite regions of the Baku, like that the previously would have quite many uh, vacant uh, um, flats. They, they, they are no more. They are sold. There are, somebody is in there. Um, and we are getting so many, uh, like the friends who are renting places that, like the, you know, the tourists with the high requirements, looking for the right. certain apartments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's why I believe that the the people who are, in terms of the quantity, no, Baku is cannot be compared to what's happening in Yerevan and Tbilisi right now. But in terms of the, let's say, uh, financial uh, influx, I would say that the people with the more financial stability, they want to have more presence in Baku. So that's why uh, the elite uh, regions of Baku, there, there is a quite a busy uh, nightlife and quite mm -hmm. a busy living in that part of the city. Okay, great. Um, now, uh, we have a couple of minutes left. There is one question that we didn't answer. It's very uh, uh, focused and targeted uh, to, uh, for Georgi about the role of the Georgian Orthodox Church. It has in the past fueled itself or viewed itself aligned in terms of ideologically or uh, value-wise with the Russian church. Uh, what is the, uh, the role of the church now, the Georgian church uh, now in terms of during the conflict? Uh, what is it saying and what is it? And it's quite influential, right? The, it has quite an influence, the Georgian Orthodox Church on politics. In Georgia. Sure. Uh, I, I just forgot you, uh, Ahmad, was uh, speaking about money. And uh, actually, they, uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, there was. Um, uh, I was speaking of... about the people with money, not about the <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's money involved. So people wait okay. or whatever. No, just. Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> so you go on, Georgia. Sorry uh, about the interruption. There is like uh, <laughs> also. Uh, a little bit straight tendency, or at least uh, I, I don't know where this money uh, goes because approximately 300, uh, 300 uh, million uh, US dollars uh, were uh, transmitted from Russia to uh, Georgia. Mm, how I, I am not sure how it was calculated, but uh, mm -hmm. for uh, uh, previous months for May, and that was uh, several times more than in previous years. So uh, it's quite, quite a lot of money is coming from there, but uh, like there are talks that people are trying to like avoid the sanctions. I'm not sure about that, but like some money is coming here also, and mm -hmm. some say that that could be used for some illicit activities. It's it's. As for the church, uh, they are quite silent, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, regarding uh, they are not um, uh, openly, at least I have not seen, uh, they did not uh, express, for example, their position regarding the Ukrainian church separation from uh, right. the uh, Russian uh, Orthodox Church. Uh, uh, they... Uh, uh, had some statements regarding like kind of like uh, how this invasion of uh, uh, Russia in Ukraine but as a whole as I understand they prefer not to comment too much uh, okay. on the issue uh, but there are obviously obviously there is frictions in 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 uh, uh, the church uh, because uh, here and there or even quite often like there are some like personalities from the church or priests who expressing quite uh, pro-Ukrainian and pro-European sentiments. Mm. And I think that this, this I, I'm, I, I cannot speak uh, uh, for uh, the proportions of those people uh, who are pro, let's say, Western oriented in church, but they are often quite loud and they have uh, like some positions in the... In, in, in this 
Right. Um, just to conclude, before the conclusion, also in terms of the whole economic impact on Armenia, as well as I mentioned, I mean, again, it shares a lot of uh, components. As Georgi mentioned, there is a we were talking about digital nomads and, you know, the situation of we have to also understand what is the demographic, but also what is the reason why Russians are coming or leaving Russia? I mean, Ukraine, we can assume that they're refugees uh, escaping war, but Russians uh, coming out is about fear of uh, conscription for males. Uh, uh, you know, uh, that's one thing, but also, you know, financial well-being. Uh, one thing to keep an eye on is also the possibility of especially Georgia and more so the case of Armenia to become backdoor economies for Russia. Uh, I was uh, a couple of uh, months ago, there was a report about how Belarus suddenly in 2015 became the largest, biggest exporter out of nowhere, became the biggest exporter of frozen fish and the biggest exporter of uh, frozen fish. So it was acting as an intermediary for Russia, which is important to keep in mind because that could also lead for the West uh, to ex uh, expand the sanctions uh, on countries that do business with them. But um, to conclude, uh, I mean, this is again, this has been a multifaceted approach. We didn't just focus about the conflict overall uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the direct conflict. We did talk about it, but it's important to keep in mind this totality and the holistic perspective at, of the impact. I think uh, once the dust settles, pun intended here, uh, I think uh, it is uh, going to be quite interesting to see how, if anything, Russia uh, will be uh, uh, putting or pushing and giving an impetus uh, to either be involved in resolving conflict, the conflicts in the region, but also to uh, to sometimes even why not instigate them or to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, sort of uh, reinvigorate them. Um, but the, the key uh, component, I, I think, uh, while we didn't talk about this, but uh, if uh, you guys disagree, please do share so. But I think uh, when it comes to the conflicts, it seems that the West is becoming less and less uh, important factor uh, in uh, resolving or trying to become a mediator uh, in these conflicts. And uh, again, because of proximity, but because of the changing dimension of global politics, it seems that Russia has been influencing both as a possible mediator, but also as a possible uh, sort of instigator of the conflicts uh, in the region. So um, it is uh, it is an eye to keep on. It's important to keep an eye on, on these. And uh, I think to a large extent, um, we call them frozen conflict. They're semi-frozen now or semi-thought now. I don't know how it is. Uh, but I think it would be quite interesting uh, to follow uh, and see the, what opportunities uh, would arise for us. Um, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for the attendees, uh, which after the first hour started declining, I think we used up their patience. Uh, but I think it was quite interesting, quite diverse. Uh, and th thank you, Ahmad. Thank you, Georgi. Uh, thank you, Caucasus Edition, uh, for hosting, uh, for giving us the opportunity. And uh, I hope, uh, I wish everyone um, um, a happy impending uh, weekend. Yeah, it was a great pleasure sharing the same panel with the church and U.S., but thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, aspect, uh, Seville, thank you a lot. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Seville, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asbit, for moderating. Yeah, thank you, Seville. <laughs> thank you. You guys have, everyone have a wonderful evening or a wonderful afternoon, whatever the time of the day, a wonderful morning, uh, wherever you are, uh, and be safe. <laughs>